So tonight we're going to talk, as we continue our lesson on the crowd, the cross, we're going to talk about Simon of Cyrene, carrying the cross with Simon. In Mark chapter 15, after the soldiers finished their cruel game, they led Jesus away to Calvary to his execution. And as they make their way towards Golgotha, Jesus is unable to carry his cross. History teaches us that the condemned man was uh, required to carry the patibulum, basically the cross beam of the cross, to the place of execution. And there that was tied across the shoulders of the condemned man. And this was the beam that we, they believe Christ was forced to carry. It's believed that due to his weariness from being up all night through his trial, through the abuse at the hands of his accusers, the abuse at the hands of the soldiers, being beaten uh, and because of blood loss from scourging, Jesus was at this point probably too weak to carry the cross all the way to Calvary. When you think about that, in Isaiah, in the prophecy of, of Christ's sacrifice, it talks about his back being plowed. Think about that. So I know some of you guys are farmers here, some have experience on the farm, and you know what it is to take a plow and put furrows in the ground to plant your seed. And Isaiah used the term plowed. And we find this occurring when the Romans scourge the back of Jesus Christ. So we could consider that there was severe blood loss causing weakness. So because of this, Christ falls and the Roman soldiers grab a man named Simon from the crowd and force him to carry Jesus' cross. In Mark chapter 15, 21, they say, They pressed into service a passerby, Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. Is this thing too loud? I'm, getting, I'm hearing some feedback. Uh, so Simon was pressed into service at this time. Let's know, talk a little bit about, about Cyrene and the Cyrenians. It's pronounced Cyrene, is located on the continent of Africa, which, which is now known as Libya. It's, it's about 900 miles from Cyrene to Jerusalem. And that journey would have taken Simon and his, uh, his uh, uh, fellow travelers several weeks to walk that distance or ride a camel or whatever in the first century. He was likely a Jew coming to Jerusalem for Passover. And that he comes from Cyrene is not surprising. In the book of 1 Maccabees chapter 15, we know that for at least 300 years before the crucifixion of Christ, there was a uh, large population of uh, proselyte Jews in this area. And today you could even go visit the city and visit the synagogue that these, that these Jews worshipped in. The ruins of the synagogue still exist today. <coughs> in Acts chapter 6 and verse 9, although not uh, in a positive light, the Cyrenians are noted as being from the, from the synagogue of the free men. Uh, but the Cyrenians that are noted in Acts chapter 6 and verse 9 are involved in murdering Stephen. So these folks were kind of all over the place. Earlier in Acts, in Acts chapter 2, as you go through the list of people who were... Uh, See, I'm not even holding her, and she's crying this time. So, uh, uh, They go through the list of all the people who were gathered together to hear Peter when he stands up and pre preaches the first gospel sermon. The Cyrenian Jews were there also. Uh, later in, Acts, in uh, chapter, Acts chapter 11 and verse 20, we hear about Cyrenians preaching to the Greek Gentiles. So they're, they're, you can see how this progressed. Uh, they went from being proselyte Jews to persecuting the church, kind of like some other characters in the Bible that we know, to being amongst the first to preach to the Greek Gentiles the gospel of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> in Acts chapter 13, another Cyrenian, Lucius, is mentioned as being in the, in the church in Antioch. And this is going to be important because we're also going to note that along with Lucius, there's also another Cyrenian known as Simeon, also known as Niger, translated Simeon or Simon the Black. Okay. Uh, since this, uh, this area was on the north tip of Africa, it's uh, uh, considered, although most of your art, if you go and look up uh, on the internet, uh, 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 Simon of Serena, 
uh, you'll see mostly uh, white caricatures in the artwork, but every once in a while you'll see a black face. It's assumed that because of the region that these uh, proselyte Jews were, were black in color. Okay. So Serene was an active center for, for the Jews before the, sac- the, the, the crucifixion of Christ, and in the decades of the early first century, it was an active center of Christianity. Okay. So something happened to these folks that caused them to convert from the old law to the new. As we take a look at the individual Simon of Serene, Serene uh, we note one thing, that he is first classified as a passerby. He was passing by. He had journeyed to Jerusalem, we believe, for the Passover. He was just at the foot of, the, of, uh, of entering, just almost ready to enter the city, and there was uh, some folks coming out. Jesus, the procession to execute Jesus and the two thieves. <clears throat> and he got caught up in this, and the Roman soldiers snatched him up and, and pressed him into service, or compelled him into service, as the Scripture says. But in the New Testament, we, we, we read of Simon of Cyrene three times. In Matthew chapter 27 and verse 32, it says, And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. In Mark chapter 15 and verse 21, And they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, Rufus to bear his cross. And in Luke chapter 23 and verse 26, and as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and on them uh, they laid his cross that he might bear it after Jesus. So we're told that this passerby was coming in from the country when the Romans took hold of him and pressed him into service to carry the cross of Jesus. We know that from John's Gospel that Jesus initially bore his own cross in John 19:17. But it's commonly held that the soldiers, because they feared that Jesus would, would collapse and not be able to, to complete the walk to, the, to, to Golgotha uh, without assistance, due to the beating that, they had, they, that he had un- undergone at their hands, they looked into the crowd for help. Uh, one scholar that I, that, that I read referenced the fact that Simon of Cyrene was probably a black man. The Romans looked upon him, oh, slave, come here and, and do this. So they pressed him into service. Now Simon was probably pretty much affected by what he was forced to do and how he was pressed into service. I know that I just got done driving 10 hours to Pennsylvania to load up uh, some furniture and drive a U-Haul truck 12 and a half hours back. And you know how it gets when you, like, you, you, you turn on, you, you get up in, off, of, off of 64 and you turn on to I-75 and you're heading the right direction and you're only 20, you know, 20 minutes from home? Consider Simon, okay? Travels 900 miles with his entourage, with his friends and family, right at the gates of Jerusalem, okay? Reaching, reaching the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the focal point of, of his journey, He's right there looking at it. See the see the see it, you know, see it in your headlights, and then some soldiers come by and snatch him up and make him turn around and go the other direction. Okay. Now I'm sure that you've had this, similar things happen in your life to you, where you had plans and were right on the verge of making them come true, and then life changes and spins you around. You go the other direction. It happens to all of us. But seems it, it seems unlikely that because of the way Mark describes it, that Simon was in Jerusalem before. It it seems unlikely that he was involved in witnessing the trial. It seems unlikely that he was involved in witnessing any of the things that Jesus did after after Jesus entered Jerusalem. He was just a uh, a, uh, uh, neutral third party at this point. Uh, And he he had not been part of the crowd that was associated with any of the events of Christ's crucifixion up to this point. And remember, he's mentioned as a passerby. A passerby. So after this lengthy trip, he's forced to help Jesus and Nazareth carry his cross, and it's not difficult to imagine some of the initial reactions to being conscripted in this service. First of all, would you be surprised and shocked if you were singled out and pulled into the procession? Certainly. 
would you be annoyed? Hey, I'm on a, I'm on, I'm on a trip here, and I have some place to be, okay, uh, and, and getting sidelined and detoured around what your, what your trip was planned, certainly. Uh, you'd probably also be reluctant to be associated with a man who was a criminal in the eyes of what looked like the Roman authorities uh, and the Jewish leaders that were following along, screaming, crucify him, crucify him, mocking him. Remember, this man was entering Jerusalem to participate in the Passover. And he was suffering the embarrassment of being told to carry a tool of punishment bearing the device that was meant for the torture of convicts. Which meant that as a Jew, at this point, with Passover approaching, he's unclean. Right? All the rules and things that they had about cleanliness. <clears throat> Although we hear nothing about Simon in Scripture after this event, it's worth considering what Simon might have made, might have, uh, made of Jesus because of his direct involvement with him following close behind him, carrying his cross, as well as with regard to things that he might have heard about Jesus after, after the fact, after he was involved in this event. We ask ourselves, did he witness the execution of Jesus, or did he put the cross down where the Romans told him and then skedaddle back towards, uh, get, get back on his, uh, on his planned path? <clears throat> Did he uh, tell his companions what happened? Was he still in town on the third day? Did he hear of the resurrection while he was in Jerusalem? Might he have been one of those Cyrenians who stood in the audience with Peter on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2? The scripture doesn't tell us this. Go ahead. I would also think the possibility, of course, it doesn't tell us that he was scared to death. Or the soldiers, and the power that they had, and the scene that was probably being right in front of him. I'm thinking if it were me, I think they'd, they'd beat this man beyond rec recognition. Maybe that's not enough. So now they've seen without me, I might be that guy on that cross. Thanks, but that, that fits right with what with what we're talking about, because that's what I want to do is paint a picture of what Simon stepped into and then see how that affected him and in turn how it can affect us today. Assuming that he didn't stay long enough in Jerusalem to hear Peter speak on, in, in, in uh, the day of Pentecost, what would Simon have made of the reports that he would have undoubtedly heard from his friends and acquaintance the, the Cyrenians who were there, because he certainly would have heard. Then what would have been his reaction to all the incredible happenings in light of, wow, I was there and I was carrying the cross and these things happened and I wasn't paying attention. Would he have been eager to tell his story or he would have, would he have kept it quiet? Did his attitude towards sharing his experience change over time? Even though Simon's not referred to again in Scripture, Okay, we know that he leaves a family legacy of Christianity. In the second, uh, in the, the the passage in Mark, it's brought out. Mark brings out the fact that Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. They're mentioned by Mark. Okay. And why would Mark do this? Because Mark probably uses those names because they would have been familiar to all the Gentile community in Rome okay, uh, for whom Mark was writing. In fact, Paul, in his letter to, to Romans, greets a Rufus and his mother. Okay. And that's the only two times in the scripture that the name Rufus is brought out. Okay. Simon's boys were quite likely young at the time of Jesus' death, but were, uh, but, but were probably uh, significantly influenced by their father, and what he experienced bearing Jesus' cross. <clears throat> if Simon was there, he would have heard the prayer that Jesus said when they came to Calvary. Simon would have knelt down and taken the cross off his back 
passed it over to the Roman soldiers and would have seen Jesus laid on the cross and nailed to the cross. If he were still there, he would have heard a man, and in the, uh, in the Greek it's present, uh, continuous tense, he would have heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And what Simon heard was a prayer of intercession for others. And it must have astonished him as he saw this man lifted up on the cross. Only Mark's gospel tells us that this was a life-changing experience for Simon. Our reading in Mark 15, Mark says something which no other gospel mentions. In verse 20. So how can we draw lessons from Simon's experience? How many here carry a cross? We're all quite familiar with that. And we tend to share the notion of carrying a cross or bearing your cross, as Jesus told us he would help us, with ailments or challenges, difficulties in life, or any number of unwelcome things that interrupt our lives or crosses that we bear. Unwelcome or as they are, generally they can't be eliminated. Maybe we can mitigate them, but in most cases they have to be endured, right? You have to work your way through it to the other side. Jesus tells us in all three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that carrying the cross is the calling of all authentic followers. Carrying the cross is the, cro- is the cost of true discipleship. Now, how we as individuals deal with our crosses makes all the difference for us and the people that we live with and the people that we influence. The best person to learn how to handle a cross from, of course, is Jesus Christ, who went to the cross of Calvary on our behalf. But as fallen human beings, it's particularly noteworthy to look at a man like Simon, who actually literally carried the cross, carried the cross of Jesus and discuss how it might have affected him and what he did with his life after this event. So Simon's possible reactions to this event can be just like ours when an unexpected cross comes our way. What we say? Surprised? Generally. Annoyed, dependent on the severity of the cross that's been laid in your lap. Reluctance, you know, and I'm not ready for this. I can't handle this. Embarrassment, what if somebody sees the cross and causes embarrassment? So as feeble human beings, we also would experience the same things that Simon might have experienced when he was put before the crowd and made to bear the cross of Jesus. When we bear our own crosses, we go through, can go through the same emotional thunderstorm. Simon's experience was vastly different from the experiences that we have. But it gives us a reflection on how we, as Christians, can handle our inevitable crosses. We deal with them every day. Some of us have crosses that we've been carrying our whole lives. The cross was unexpected for Simon, and the cross is often unexpected for us also. But it shouldn't be because we're told, if you're going to be a follower of me, you need to pick up your cross and hit the trail to paraphrase the scripture. Uh, He could not refuse the cross. Like Brett said, the Roman soldiers were standing there and pressed him into service, compelled him, is what the, the, the scripture says, to carry the cross. And there was no option for refusal. When you put on Jesus Christ in baptism, there's no option to refuse to carry your cross. Well, we'll never know for sure the answer to the questions that Simon faced in the aftermath of his encounter with Jesus. We can use similar questions to examine ourselves. When we look at our own lives, do we see through our crosses knowing that there is no cross, where there's no cross, there's no resurrection? No cross, no resurrection. You ever thought about that? I never have until I I plagiarized it from some Bible scholar that I got reference material from. It's a simple statement. 
Without Christ going to the cross, there would be no resurrection. There would be no forgiveness of sin. There would have been no victory over death. For us as individuals, despite how heavy our crosses have become, do we continue to look past the pain and the suffering and the tribulation and remain focused on the reward? You know, I, I, I look back at the, some of the sermons I've preached at Dreyfus over the last few years, and I probably have done 20 or 30 sermons on walking the straight and narrow path, keeping focused on the reward, walking in the light, following the light, looking to, looking, looking to Jesus. And sometimes, even though I've done that and understand that I need to do that, sometimes I find myself caught up in the world and in the flesh and not focused on that. Do we get from those who we interact with, especially family and friends, church family, support to help us through our struggles, or are our family and friends impediments to spiritual growth? You know, uh, uh, when I was on Guam, we had a, a work that we were doing was called a student center at the University of Guam, where all the the students from all the Micronesian islands, you, you name an island, we had students would come there, and we would teach them the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they would go back home. And actually, we did uh, eventually establish a church in Ponape, a congregation there. But some of these folks, their families were Catholic, strict Catholic. And to turn your back on the Catholic church was a, was a I'm dead to you type of offense. And we, Jackie and I did have some friends whose families just turned their backs on them and said, you're not my son anymore. And that's a, that's a tough one. But remember what Jesus said? If you're not willing to do that, there's some work that needs to be done. Do we understand the Spirit and how the Spirit assists us in carrying our crosses? We all understand the Spirit dwells in us. There's things that, we, that, that you can understand about yourself by knowing that the Spirit is, in, is, is within you. Do we let the Spirit guide us? That little, you know, some people call it the little voice in the back of your head that says, maybe you don't want to do that. And then you go ahead and do it, and then you're severely convicted because you made a bad decision or exercised poor judgment. That's your spirit. People who don't have the spirit don't have to deal with being convicted after they make a bad decision. They just have to deal with pain or whatever the consequences of their bad decision. One thing we asked if, you know, do you think Simon might have shared his experience? Wow, that was Jesus Christ, and I carried his cross think he was guilty about it or was he was he ecstatic that he got to participate in this event where Christ was Christ was victorious over death do we in the same manner do we share our blessings with others I don't I'll talk about anything under the sun but I will very seldom talk about how I'm blessed and I certainly am sometimes my kids have to remind me about it being blessed and sharing what Christ has done in our lives with our friends and our family and those that we encounter uh, is, is, is a skill that, that we should all strive to obtain. You know, I, I, you, all, you all know I went to Alaska with, uh, with uh, Owen and, and Rhonda, and I've never been one-on-one -on -one with Owen for that long a period of time that I could see, all, see how he is. Yeah. Oh, there you are. Hey. But that man there, the one you most you know, this has been many, many years, has a gift of just going up to somebody that he don't know on the street and sparking up a conversation. And it doesn't matter who's waiting on him, whether the bus is waiting on him or we're waiting to get him. But but he has he has a he has a gift that I want to obtain someday. Because he certainly understands his blessings and he's not hesitant to share them with others. Unlike Simon, whose knowledge of Jesus at the time that he met him on his way to his death was a passing knowledge at best, we don't have that excuse. We don't have that excuse of not knowing Jesus because we do know him. And we probably know him better than any of these people who stood at the foot of the cross. We probably know him better than the disciples at, 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 uh, who stood there at this event. So whatever our initial reactions are to a cross that might set itself on us, that we have to bear, whatever setback or tragic event, we can be sure that we have Jesus Christ to fall back on 
And he gave us his word that he would be there for us. So just as Simon was pressed into service to carry a cross, as crosses come our way, whether they're pressed on us, or we passively accept them, or actively welcome them in order to reach our heavenly goal, we need to look to God's grace to help us to bear those crosses and step forward in life. Any questions or comments about that? Anybody have any amusing stories? Owen? No, no. <coughs> I'd make the last part up. Okay. <laughs> When Simon was pressed into service, he followed Christ and moved forward. In Mark chapter 15, we'll read, when, when they mocked him, they took off the purple from him and put on his own clothes and led him out to crucify him. And they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And they brought him into the place called Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of a skull, and they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. Notice, we're, once again, we're told about Simon of Cyrene. In Luke, after laying the cross on him, they made him carry it behind Jesus. They compel Simon. And it's, it says that Simon, who passed by coming out of the country, only Mark tells us this that Simon was passing by. And what Mark is telling us is that Simon was coming from his home, from the countryside, heading into Jerusalem. He's going into the city. Okay. And as he's going into the city, he runs across the procession of the, the, those who are crucifying Jesus. But Jesus is traveling the opposite direction. He's traveling from the city to Golgotha. So their paths meet outside the city. And without a doubt, according to Scripture, Jesus and Simon were both traveling in opposite directions that, that day. Simon was coming in, Jesus was going out, and we're told in Mark 15 that Simon, who was walking into the city, suddenly found himself at the, at the direction of the Roman soldiers, turned around, and finds himself walking exactly the opposite direction that he was walking. After meeting <clears throat> Jesus on the road to Jerusalem, his path was completely turned around. As a prepare for the study, you know, have you ever gone to the New Testament and looked, uh, looked, uh, looked up turned around or turned upside down? There's quite a few passages of scripture that deal with that about the apostles being those who were turning the world upside down or people turning aside and going another direction. But here we see it portrayed in the meeting of Jesus and Simon that Simon, Jesus is on the path that God put him on and he's traveling that path. He's not going to be turned around. He's not going to be stopped from doing what God sent him here to do. But Simon, on the other hand, who just is finishing up a 900 mile journey he gets turned around certainly God's hand was in this and his experience of meeting the Lord is going to change his life walk his life walk appears to follow the it literally follows the footsteps of Christ at least to Golgotha and it appears through Mark's discussion of Rufus and some other things concerning his son Alexander that his life turned around from being a proselyte Jew to, to Christianity. If we as Christians are walking our path of life and, and are not experiencing any particularly severe problems, we're probably quite willing to say that we will offer it up when we're faced with the next challenge. Yeah, I'm ready for it. But when we all actually have to grapple with physical, spiritual, or emotional battles, we're more than happy to do what? We know we can't do it on our own. We know that we're not going to make it to heaven on our own. We're either going to go to our brothers and sisters, and we're certainly going to go to Christ, and we're going to go to the Father to ask for assistance to get through these things. And I'll tell you what, I do not understand, know or do I want to know how people who do not know Jesus Christ, how people who do not believe in God get through these same trials and tribulations that we deal with every day because we're human. 
Well, we know how some folks get through it. Drugs, alcohol, whatever vice you want to name. But we have Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, too, when we were buried with him in baptism, we met him in the watery grave of baptism and turned our lives around and followed in his footsteps, just as Simon of Cyrene followed him with the cross to Golgotha. In the case of Simon, Jesus used his own way of the cross to draw Simon to him. And the encounter with Simon would not have happened if Christ had not been carrying the cross. Just as all of us, if Christ had not borne the cross of Calvary, we would not have encountered him either. So you see, our journey is not too dissimilar from that of Simon. If he had not met Christ carrying the cross, he possibly would have never encountered Jesus. He possibly would have never encountered Christianity and would have never engaged Simon may have never come to pay attention to the gospel message if he had not crossed paths with Jesus. And as a result, Simon's sons, who uh, would probably not have become active in Christianity as we believe they did. Who knows how many lives they changed in their lifetime? Because we have evidence of Alexander, uh, uh, si- uh, son of Simon in Jerusalem. We have uh, uh, possible uh, scriptural evidence of Simon himself being in Antioch, Rufus being in Antioch, Simon's wife being in Antioch, and then later on, in, later on in Acts chapter 16, being in Rome. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. Jesus pulled Simon and led the way to Golgotha, and it's the same path that's given to us every generation since Christ died on the cross. He draws us by his suffering, calling us to follow him. But it doesn't end at, at the cross because we all know that Jesus conquered death. Jesus was victorious over death. And in suffering on the cross, he gave us our way out. He gave us our life, our purpose. And he calls us to just as Simon picked up the cross and followed him to Golgotha, to pick up our own crosses and carry our own crosses and walk with him. Because the reward with that, if we all understand, is everlasting. Any questions or comments? There are at least four things the cross did for Simon. The first thing is it compelled him to be put in the presence of Jesus Christ. Think about that. He was following behind the man, following his, in his footsteps. And outside the, the, that cross that Jesus was carrying, Simon would not have been, been brought into the presence of Jesus. Imagine yourself as Simon, reaching down, picking up the cross at the instructions of the Roman soldiers, and then following in his walk to his death. Seeing everything that was going on, hearing the crowds mocking him, hearing the, the things that Jesus said, seeing the things that Jesus did, all the suffering without, without opening his mouth. Instead of cursing those who persecuted, he, he blessed them and asked the Lord to forgive them. He was there for all of that. It also compelled him, compelled Simon, to follow in Jesus' steps. All the way to Calvary. How often do we step in front of God's will? How often do we not follow the steps of Jesus you know, as youngsters, we're, we're, we're always talking about the footsteps of Jesus and following in his footsteps. As adults, we sing footsteps of Jesus, but all too often we forget that. Without being, with being compelled to follow right behind Jesus, he followed the Savior and he was step, step in step with Jesus Christ. He only went as fast as Jesus went. He, he, when Jesus stopped, he stopped. And when Jesus proceeded, he proceeded. He was compelled to follow the steps of the Savior. And in like manner, we too should be compelled to follow Jesus in the same manner. Stop when he stops. Move when he moves. Rest when he rests. And only go as fast as he goes. Simon was also compelled to participate 
in the greatest work in the history of the world. What would you do if you could be there? Well, they wouldn't want me there because I'd probably try to do something and cut somebody's ear off with a sword or, or go and hide or do something. I'd probably be just like Peter. Okay. But Simon was invited to participate in the greatest act of sacrifice that would change the world forever. You know, today we have a lot of heroes. <laughs> it's probably not a good time to talk about it here, you know, the sports heroes or, or whoever that want to take on a cause. That, but, they're, you know, they're womanizers, they're, 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 they're drug addicts, they're not the best examples in the world. But on the cross of Calvary hung the greatest example that we could ever have. The greatest hero that we could ever have. And I think most of us realize that. <clears throat> The last thing that the cross did for Simon was it changed his family. We've talked about this. It changed his family forever. Mark names his sons, Rufus and Alexander. In Romans chapter 16 and verse 13, Rufus, uh, Rufus chosen in the Lord, is, is, uh, is brought up by Paul. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Okay. So the Apostle Paul identifies Rufus as one who was chosen by the Lord. Okay. Special, special person and identifies the mother of Rufus, Rufus as also his mother. Very special people. Rufus means red, the son of Simon uh, the Cyrenian. In uh, uh, Mark chapter 15, 20, uh, 21, when the Romans compel Simon to carry the cross, uh, this is, uh, uh, it talks about uh, the father of uh, Simon, the father of uh, Alexander and Rufus, and it's probably uh, this same Rufus in Romans 16 and 13 who is at this point with his mother a disciple at Rome. Uh, he's also identified as a Christian who is probably held in high esteem by the Apostle uh, Paul. But Mark also mentions him along with his brother Alexander as persons well known to the readers in uh, Mark chapter 15 and, 20, and verse 21. So it's, it's surmised that Mark identified the, uh, the father of Alexander and Rufus, identifying those two sons, because at the time of his writing of, of his gospel, they were well-known people in the, in, in the church. So we see what the cross may have done for Simon, which brings us to the thought, what has the cross done for you? What, you know what? This is a hard bunch of lessons to get through. I told you I'd have a hard time with this. But uh, until I saw that question, I've never thought about it. I have never thought about it. And if I thought about it and wrote down notes, we could probably talk about that for 12 weeks or longer. But I wanted to leave you all with that question so that you could think about that. We see how Simon picked up the cross and followed in the steps of Jesus. We saw how the cross may have changed his life forever. What has the cross done for you? I'm not going to ask you to answer that question tonight. Ask yourselves and think about it. What's the word? Ponder. Ponder that over the next week. The idea that the Apostle Paul identifies Rufus as, the Lord, as one whom the Lord picked out to be his very own in one translation in Romans 16, 13. Lends credence to the fact that the man, Simon, who was from, uh, from Serene, coming from the, out from the country and forced to carry Jesus, crossed, Jesus Christ's cross, had an a, a, a influence that surpassed the events at Calvary. <clears throat> By his country, we know that Simon was from North Africa. There were many Jews living in North Africa during that time. I told you that the, the Jewish synagogue in uh, uh, Serene was, uh, was in existence about for 300 years before the event on Calvary. Simon could have been a Jewish national or a converted Jew, and he was on his way to the Passover. And the chances are that he had no idea who Jesus was, what Jesus had been doing, 
because he had been traveling from the countryside heading into Jerusalem. All Simon knew was that one minute he's walking along, minding his own business, and the next moment he was being forced by Roman soldiers to pick up a heavy piece of cross beam and, and help some mangled criminal get to, get to his destination because he had dropped it. Simon was just a guy who was forced into a situation that was far beyond his control. He couldn't say no. But when you think about this and we think about all the events at Calvary, who was in control? God was in control. If Rufus was in fact his son, as surmised, then God used Simon's forced situation to bring about the best situation for both father and son and the entire family. Jesus was not forced to die on the cross. He went there of his own accord. Calvary did not take place by surprise. Jesus came to earth to go there and sacrifice himself for us. God's always in control during this whole event. Jesus never lost control. And Simon may have been forced to carry the cross, but our Savior gave his life freely. Anybody have any questions or comments before we close the lesson today? Well, I thank you for your attention, and we'll be back again next week.